Jim Styler, Chief Financial Officer of Kentucky Housing Corporation, and I promise you I'm the least important person here today. Uh, you all are more important, and this esteemed panel is much more important than I am. And uh, uh, you just heard them all get awards uh, presented to them at the luncheon. These, I was told, weigh about 20, 20 pounds or 15 to 20 pounds of glass, and, and they are really uh, very nice awards, and there'll be a photo session uh, after today's session. But uh, it's ironic that they would ask the chief financial officer, the boring, uh, non-innovative, number cruncher, debits and credits, to moderate the innovation panel. And so uh, it gives me great privilege to actually be able to do that. And I'm not as uninnovative as my uh, title might indicate. But uh, again, these are the folks that are cutting and blazing new trails in what we do. And that's very important. And uh, that's all I'm going to say besides introducing these fine folks. And the first person up today is the Community Ventures Corporation representative, Milk Sharp. And he's going to discuss about the innovative solutions for affordable housing. It's okay to bring Milda up with a nice warm round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, I have this little machine, this little noise making machine here too. It, it'll <laughs> so, uh, there you go. So do and well because I also this, is I also this have working one now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, um, thank you for that warm round of applause. I feel very innovated by that, and I am very pleased to be here today to uh, share with you all the innovation that Community Ventures was able to develop, um, which led to us ultimately receiving this award as well. So uh, my name is Milt Sharp. I am the president for eHome Network. I work with Community Ventures. I'm based out of Washington, D.C., where my main office is located at. And what I'd like to do is to just give you a little bit of background about eHome. Before I go into that, though, I, I want to talk about why we felt it was necessary for us to develop uh, online home bar education. I think oftentimes when we talk about the home ownership education and counseling industry, it is, it is one of the best kept secrets. It has a lot of value. Um, certainly a default resistant home buyer has a lot of value to not only the lenders but also to the communities that they go in. When someone falls into foreclosure, as we heard today, no one really benefits from that. And so what we feel very strongly is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and that in being able to provide folks with access to information that can help guide them along the path to moving into home ownership, that having access to that trusted advisor can really help you. Um, in Intuitively, we've always felt like this has been a good thing. Um, now we have empirical data that has shown the effectiveness and the impact of home ownership education and counseling. When we talk about it, um, it does a couple of things. One is it, re it reduces loan delinquency. So first time home buyers who receive home ownership education and counseling had in this particular study a 29 cent reduction, 29 percent reduction in delinquency rates. This helps to create a default resistant home buyer. Improved financial health and increased knowledge. In one study, borrowers who received home ownership education and counseling had significant increases in their credit scores and or their overall improved credit health. And so that has ramifications far beyond just home ownership. We know that the credit score can impact where, not only where a person lives, but their ability to seek employment also. It also helped to create a more efficient transaction. So borrowers are better able to measure their ability to be able to pay. What we saw in the foreclosure crisis is that oftentimes folks who didn't necessarily have the knowledge that they needed to make a good sound financial decision were presented oftentimes with the payment that only included their principal and interest. And we know that there is also that taxes and insurance that must be paid as well. And not understanding the terms behind what they were being involved with. I'm one of those believers. I don't believe there's any bad mortgage products. I just don't think every mortgage product is for every person. There are some that fit certain situations a little bit better than others. And home buyer education can help uh, to deliver that. And, and ultimately increase mortgage sustainability. So council borrowers are 67% more likely to remain current uh, on their mortgages and, and everyone benefits uh, from that. So I, I, I felt it necessary to kind of frame why it's important that we move forward with home buyer education. And now just a little bit of background on eHome America. 
It is an online education program for prospective home buyers that's linked directly to HUD certified counseling agencies. After an individual goes through our online home buyer education, they then have the ability to meet one on one with a HUD certified counselor. Why is that important? Oftentimes, there are going to be questions that they're going to have. There may be access to down payment and closing cost assistance programs, and by being able to meet with the counselor after that, they can also help them to identify the resources that are out out there to help them to move in to home ownership. It was developed by Community Ventures and it was originally created uh, through a grant from NeighborWorks America of which we are a part of that national intermediaries network. That grant was provided to Community Ventures as a means of being able to offer online home buyer education to their rural customers who would often have to travel over an hour or more to get access to their face-to-face -face home buyer education. And so Community Ventures back in 2009 decided to, in order to assist their customers with getting access to this education, that being able to develop an online system would be able to do just that. In its development, it exceeds what are called the national industry standards for home ownership education and counseling. There is now a body that indicates what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in the delivery of these services. Our program exceeds those standards that are set around home ownership education and counseling. EHOME in its current development is a structured web-based home buyer education program as I indicated. Uh, it's broken into chapters so consumers can stop and start at a pace and in a place that's convenient for them. So there's no longer the need to now to have to sit in an eight hour day class or break it up over multiple days and going to home buyer education. They're able to log on at a time that works best for them. And what we have found in doing an analysis of our users is that many of them log on in the evening, uh, particularly those who have children. They will wait until they've put their children down for the evening and log on and do their home buyer education. This works for them. And when we start talking about who our customer for tomorrow is going to be, I want to call particular attention to those millennials, those folks who spend about a third of their life on the web. And when they're looking for home ownership, the first step that they take oftentimes is to go to the internet. So being able to meet them where they are and provide them with access to a service that we know will work for them is very key uh, to assisting them to moving into home ownership. Um, it uses multiple adult learning techniques. Uh, there are multiple quizzes and videos through there to create a level of interactivity so someone is not constantly just bored to death by reading material. They could, we could hand them a book and they could do that. This is also a high level of interactivity and it provides for the organizations who are those follow-up organizations to provide the one-on-one -on -one counseling a robust admin panel behind, which allows them to look at and identify where a consumer may have struggled a bit in terms of their learning of the modules that are in there so that when they are meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, they can tailor that one-on-one -on -one session to then narrow down, zone in on areas where there may have been some difficulty in terms of their moving through. A consumer can jump around in the program, but they can only go backwards. Um, after they've completed a module. They cannot jump to the next module unless they've passed it with an 80% or better test score. Now, for, for eHome America, our online home bar education fits directly into our overall business goals. And one of our goals is really to look at increasing the amount of first-time home buyers who receive home ownership education and counseling in advance of moving into home ownership. Uh, roughly 2 million first-time home buyers uh, HUD's estimate is less than 200,000 of them received home ownership education and counseling. And when we begin to think about the home buying process, which is, you know, potentially for many families, if not almost all families, the largest financial transaction that they'll ever make in their lives, to know that they have to move into that without the assistance of a trusted advisor and proper education, to me, is unacceptable. And going forward, we have to find the way to be able to offer this and provide this to every person who's in desire and need of moving into home ownership and would like to have access to that trusted advisor who can provide them with that information. Doing it online provides us with that opportunity. We also want to help to increase the perceived value of home ownership education and counseling. More and more studies are being done to show the value of it that it brings to consumers. And we also recognize and realize that the support for this oftentimes is very difficult. 
we saw through the foreclosure crisis, many of the supporters for homeownership education and counseling, such as financial institutions, had gone under or had been absorbed by others. And so the sustainability for this started to dwindle. And so organizations now needed to find a means of being able to generate revenue to support their delivery of homeownership education and counseling services. This is done by utilizing eHome. And while this will not solve their complete sustainability issues, it does provide an access to revenue, which can help offset the cost of the delivery of these services as well. So eHome has grown tremendously, and, and we, again, are appreciative of being recognized for receiving this innovation award. We have over 100,000 users now who have completed our online home bar education since our beginning in 2010. Over 375 nonprofit partners in 49 states, and that's soon to be 50. Uh, I've got someone in the queue from Idaho right, who is ready to move forward with being an e-home partner, as well as from Puerto Rico and Guam. And I'm told the Virgin Islands is in queue as well. I'm, I've, I've offered to go there to provide any TA support <laughs> if, if, if they need to make a decision. Uh, we're currently endorsed by USDA also. And in being endorsed by USDA, we receive what's called Called first preference. That means any of their customers who are looking to get access to their products that require homeownership education and counseling, if they choose to use online education, that eHome is their option and that they should you look to use and utilize eHome as well. We also are endorsed by NeighborWorks America as a NeighborWorks organization, and we have partnerships with 12 state housing finance agencies across the country who offer down payment closing cost assistance programs that require home buyer education. They're utilizing and using eHome as well. And in our unique revenue sharing model, we charge customers $99 to log on to use eHome and go through it. eHome keeps $25 of that for an admin fee, and we use that to support the development of our product to make sure that we stay consistent and current with changes in the market. That other $74 is actually returned to our partner agencies as revenue on a monthly basis. And so when we start talking about the sustainability for the delivery of homeownership education and counseling, while $74 a person won't necessarily be able to do that, I like to jokingly say there will be no silver bullet solution to the sustainability for homeownership education and counseling services. It's going to be more like silver buckshot. And eHome is, is a part of that, that buckshot. And to that extent, over this past Last year, in 2014, we were able to provide $1.7 million in revenues in support to our partner agencies who are using our product. So what are the benefits? Well, as you can imagine, for consumers, using eHome allows them convenience. And we know that convenience is very important in a society that thrives on instant gratification, whether it's, it's pop it in a microwave or add water and stir. Being able to have access to it when it works and is most convenient for them is very appealing. So eHome is available for them 24 hours a day, seven days uh, a week. It eliminates any travel time or costs associated with possibly child care to attend that course and so that's very appealing. Sometimes individuals can save anywhere from the cost of the registration, $50 to $100, without having to pay for a babysitter or invest in, in filling up the tank to travel. And uh, as I indicated, the, it's, a, it's a modest cost at $99 uh, for consumers. So our partner agencies who use our product also see some benefit to it. And again, it's, it's access to homeownership education and counseling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Many of them are, are confronted oftentimes with that person who's going to be going to closing in another day or two, and, and their homebuyer education class isn't available until the end of the month. What, what do you do with those folks? Well, having that online option when they can log on and, and do it in a time that works for them is very useful. It provides them with an additional alternative service service delivery model. So this is not to replace their face-to-face -face home buyer education class. It's to put another tool in their toolkit in order to deliver these services. And so now when they have the option of working with millennials who may often not choose to come to that face-to-face -face class, um, they can provide them with the option of using the online, which again helps them to reach that younger, more sa technologically savvy uh, buyer. 
provides a revenue stream for them. We've had one organization in 2014 generate $78,000 in revenue in using eHome America. And while that's not ideally going to happen with all of our partner agencies, when you talk about the cost of uh, staff, and those are unrestricted dollars, and so for the nonprofits who are in the room, unrestricted dollars is, is music to their ears oftentimes, and their ability to be able to use it to enhance their programs and services are very appealing. And ultimately, it helps to build their capacity to touch more folks in a more cost-efficient manner, which at the end of the day uh, can impact the bottom line in a very significant way. So to wrap up, as um, I know you want to hear from the others who are here, uh, we're, we're just confident that our product provides the highest level of convenience, service, and support to our customers, and that we've built a product that will continue to deliver the products and services that home buyers value that they need and the exceptional customer service they deserve in any online presence an online presence that, that really matters. So, so thank you very much again for, except for the presentation of this award to us, and I will take questions from Just folks if, 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 you, if, hour, if we have the time. We'll at the end also. Okay, sure. All right, questions going once, going twice. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you, Milt. Um, a couple of things, I'll, I'm going to parrot a couple of your comments, and I've been in single family servicing for close to 40 years, and he was right. There are no winners in a foreclosure. And so uh, any foreclosure you can avoid and bring a, a, a tool like this, accessible, removing the obstacles, timeliness, user friendly, this is something that's going to help prevent future foreclosures. Next up is the winner of the Innovation Solutions uh, on the en Energy Efficiency Multifamily Section. Uh, the winner of this year's award is the Housing Partnership. And uh, here to speak on this, on this uh, innovation is uh, Mr. Gabe Fritz. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, I can certainly say that uh, I'm coming from the Housing Partnership in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we're an affordable housing developer. Uh, we provide homeowner counseling, um, uh, home buyer education. We administer a particular program uh, for employer assisted housing with um, uh, Norton Healthcare in Louisville, Kentucky. And a large portion of those folks use eHome. So there are a lot of people that work in the healthcare industry that have different shift hours that can't always make our classes. So it's been a great product for them uh, and really useful for us to deliver that service to them. Um, and so before I talk a little bit about what we do and and the, the project that we got an award for, um, I just want to say a, a couple of things. First of all, I want to congratulate everybody else uh, that, that has been recognized today. And then I also want you to know, obviously, that I'm just, I'm a representative of a team of literally scores and scores of people. Uh, that worked on this project and, and that made it happen. So today we're talking about Most Blessed Sacrament uh, Senior Apartments. And um, this project, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the financing um, in a couple of slides. Um, but this project is something um, that we've, this sort of project is something that we've done almost 10 times now, um, which is to convert an old school building into senior housing. Um, and, and kind of the, the impetus for the whole deal is a, a program from HUD uh, called Section 202 that provides particular funding on the front end and the back end for affordable housing for, for low-income seniors uh, 62 and up. Um, and as an organization, as I said, we provide home buyer education, we do development, we do multifamily, we do single family, uh, and every time that we start working on a project, we try to uh, integrate as many green principles and as many energy efficient principles as the project allows. So just, just organizationally, we try to do that. We can't always do the same level uh, of involvement for every project. A lot of times it, uh, we have budget constraints, we have site constraints, we have uh, constraints because it's not new construction, it's, all, it's, it's adaptive reuse, which is something we'll talk about today. Um, but we always have the goal of making it the most energy efficient uh, project that we can. Um, 
this, the, the basic synopsis of this project, uh, as I said, is that we started with a building that was built the year after a very large and famous flood uh, in Louisville uh, in 1938. And um, the, the back of that school actually had a convent that was built uh, about 20 years later uh, that also ended up being implemented uh, in the project. Um, but so the project was to take this building uh, and turn it into 31 bedroom units of housing for seniors. Um, and then we used the convent building that again had been attached to the back uh, as a community resource center, which provides um, a location to provide counseling services, resident services. Uh, we have a training room, we have a board room, we have rooms that community partners can use as well. Um, and so uh, it was a total gut renovation. Um, we, the, the school had not been in use for probably eight or nine years. Um, and so we replaced all the major mechanical systems, uh, put a new roof on it, um, uh, redid all of the windows, um, just basically all the new landscaping, all new uh, storm drainage, just about everything that you can imagine. So uh, a little bit about the financing because we employ what I like to call uh, the all Groton uh, financing structure to most of the things we do. I don't know about you guys, my grandmother, my mother, my wife makes this awesome dish called potato all Groton and it's like a layer of potatoes and then cheese and a layer of potatoes and cheese and so here's the potatoes and cheese. Um, you can't do what we do with just a single funding source, right? So you'll see the list of uh, the HUD 202 capital advancing pre-development grant. We, we got a, a pre-development loan from MHC, which is uh, another entity in Louisville. Uh, federal and state historic tax credits, 4% uh, low income housing tax credit, and then we used a bond instrument. Um, as a vehicle in which we rolled all that stuff up into. So really complicated stuff. Um, total development cost uh, just north of $7 million. Kind of this is actually a photograph from the, the front set of the plans, uh, but just to give you an idea about the size, uh, the site area is actually not that much bigger than, than the building, right? Um, so it's pretty pretty tight site. Um, and again, we've got 30 total one bedroom units uh, with a couple of uh, handicap and uh, sight and mobile hearing impaired units included as well. The location um, is within, we have an inner beltway in Louisville, so it's within that inner beltway of I-264. And we're really, this particular location is proximus to the University of Louisville and Churchill Downs, if you're familiar with, with where those, either of those are in the city of Louisville. Um, and here's another kind of uh, 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 photograph that then shows in yellow the entire site. Uh, as I said, we've done several of these projects, and, and so typically what we'll do is you see a large white rectangle kind of in the middle of, of the area that's in yellow. That's a gymnasium that the parish uh, still owns, it still functions, and so we carved out our site area around that because we just wanted the school building for this particular project. Um, here's a photograph of, of the building before we began construction, and um, it's kind of a weird angle, but it, it captures kind of everything that we have going on. So that's the convent directly below the blue arrow. Then you can kind of see larger windows to the right of where the school building begins. Behind it, you see kind of a blue metal building. That's the gymnasium that, that I, I was just previously talking about. And then there's a single family home right there. So this, is, this location is on a, just about a half a block off a pretty major arterial road in the city, um, but then it backs up to a residential neighborhood. So that house is very indicative of kind of the rest of the single family housing that extends down that block and in, in, in each block in, in either direction. Um, uh, again, here's another site plan that just shows, um, again, if, if you think about the, the photograph that we just looked at, everything that's in yellow shows the landscaping and the parking layout um, that we devised for the site. 
Here's a photograph of the building before we began. So this used to be the front entry to the school. Um, so you can see there are some windows that are kind of busted up. We got a couple of window units um, for air conditioning because uh, it didn't, they didn't have central air back in 1937. Um, here are a, a few photographs pre-construction and um, you'll see you know, there's, there was some water damage. There were certain parts of the building that weren't in the best of shape. But you'll see um, wood trim along the doors, along the windows. We reused uh, thousands and thousands of board feet of wood trim um, and a lot of original doors. So those doors that you see swinging open in the hallway, we re, re, reuse those, and those are actually the entry doors going into the apartment buildings. And you see it's, it's kind of obscured by some water damage, but you can see in the photograph on the right, there is um, an old chalkboard, and you'll see some photographs at the end of the project to show we integrated some of those into the uh, units as well. Uh, and again, here are some photographs before we started construction. Uh, that was the cafeteria, which was on the ground floor. This building's actually, it's not, it doesn't have a basement, but it's about 42 inches below grade, the bottom floor here. So this area, this open area was a, a cafeteria and is now the first floor um, uh, of the apartment building. So before we started construction, um, we had kind of laid out these goals. You know, as part of the application, you have to tell everybody what you're going to do. Um, but when you're dealing with a building that's approaching 100 years in age, some of this stuff is kind of daunting. So once we, and I'm not going to read down through all of, all of these goals. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys take a look at that while I speak. But basically, you have to do a lot of planning on the front end. So we had to have meetings with the architect and with the general contractor and with key subcontractors, um, with our uh, lead consultant, with our, our Energy Star Raider, to talk about how are we going to attack the exterior envelope? How are we going to make this 100-year-old building perform like a new or newer building? So a lot of that you always run into challenges. Bob Bennett is here from Bossy Mattingly, and, and Bob's team um, headed up the construction efforts. And we did a lot of planning up front, Bob, but we always ran into challenges along the way, right? So the key is just to have a good functional team that can you can't pre-plan and avoid all of those challenges. You can do a good job and get about an 80% mitigation rate, but there's always going to be stuff that pops up. Um, but we had a great team to 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 address those challenges as we went along. And frankly, we learned a lot too. As I said, we've done this eight or nine times. So we try to build our knowledge base on a project by project basis and take the things that we learned from the previous experiences and, and integrate them into, into these newer projects. So um, uh, this slide just talks a, a little bit about uh, in this list of goals, one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to divert material out of landfills. So we were able to divert about 70% of all the construction waste and demolition waste from landfills. We had special dumpsters uh, set up on site, and then we just asked those subs to give us kind of monthly reports on that tonnage. Um, this is a, an illustrative uh, kind of grouping of photographs to show some of the efforts that were made in making this an efficient building. Um, Obviously, that's uh, foam insulation on the left, on the right, blower door testing. So once we employed these specific methods of making this building energy efficient, you have to kind of go back at the end and test it out and see if your efforts, um, if your efforts uh, were fruitful. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about the building envelope. And I wanted to, there's a, a photograph that's a little more illustrative. but. One of the big challenges, th there, there were a couple of really major challenges. The first one was the, the exterior envelope of the building, and the second were the windows. Uh, and then the third would be insulation and the roofing. But since we were using historic tax credits, we, we had some 
pretty severe constraints on how we dealt with windows and how we dealt with the exterior envelope of the building. So we came up with a system um, that we had used on a project before that really helps to, to do three basic things on that exterior envelope of the building, which was a masonry construction, as you can see from the photographs. We need to get a thermal break. We need to get, we need to stop air infiltration, and then we need to actually provide insulation, right, in that exterior wall assembly. So the approach that we took was to actually take one-inch foam board, and actually I think I have a picture of it here. So that's the pink or, or purple foam board that you see there. Um, and apply that directly to the masonry. And then we framed the wall directly to that. And then we blew in wet blown cellulose insulation into that wall cavity and then drywalled. The detail that I didn't cover is that when we put the foam up, we then used Tyvek tape at all of those seams. So we, we had an effective air barrier. We had that thermal break with that foam insulation. And then we were able to build the wall cavity at and then out and then add that wet blown cellulose to provide additional information into the wall structure uh, and, and then top it off with drywall. And then in this particular case at this window, take all the old trim off, put a little bit of uh, an extender on it and then put all the original old wood trim back on as well. Um, we also wanted to look at how we could use renewable energies uh, in this project. So as we um, as, as we, uh, we knew we had to replace the roof and so the, 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 top, the top photograph shows the roof prior to construction. Um, we were able to use um, a new material that was a lighter color to replace the roof after, and we blew a bunch of insulation up into the attic as well. But we also had some meetings and, and again, stuff like this is important to do before you start construction. If you know you want to have a solar array, which is what you're looking at in the bottom picture, you see that big long line of air conditioning units and plumbing stacks and vents and stuff. You got to figure out how you locate all that stuff so that you can make room for all the solar arrays on the outside uh, uh, area of the roof. You have to do that early on because if you don't, then you're going to have plumbing stacks and air conditioning units all over the place because that's just how buildings typically are built. Um, this is a diagram that shows the entire solar array um, on both roofs of the convent and the, the school building. Now this system is about, um, it's almost 50 uh, kilowatts. Um, there's, I think, 30 on one roof and 17 on, on the smaller roof. And those are all tied in. It's net metering. So basically that just offsets. It's designed to offset about 18 to 20 percent of the overall energy consumption. That's what it was modeled to do um, of the buildings. Excuse me. Net metering means that you just, it doesn't actually, it just kind of slows your meter down. Basically that energy goes back to the energy provider and offsets your bill. Um, and it's got a simple payback of about 12 to 15 years. Another photograph of the PV panels. And you can't see these. The other, you know, they're maybe from one or two particular angles, but this building's tall enough that you really can't see these when you're up close at the building. When you get a little ways away, you can see them. Um, so beyond the renewable portion of this project, we also wanted to take a look at lighting and plumbing fixtures, right? So Energy Star um, light fixtures um, and CFL bulbs, ceiling fans to help circulate the air, um, and low flow plumbing fixtures. Um, and typically, we just set minimums and just put those in the specs, right? So in some cases, we may, uh, you know, the toilets, we, we might have upgraded a little bit to get a, a high performance and efficient toilet. Um, the water fountains, you know, we, we tried to look at every plumbing fixture in the entire building and make sure we were getting the most efficient thing that we could, you know, fit into the budget. Um, so those water fountains are made out of recycled material. They have low energy consumption and they also have low water consumption as well, uh, as related to, to other, um, to other fixtures, to regular fixtures. Um, we also wanted to, to address uh, stormwater. In Louisville, we have a combined sewer, which means that your sanitary and stormwater 
travel in the urban service district in the same piping subterranean piping system and in large rain events there are weirs across the city that actually then dump the access into directly into streams untreated um that's a problem i see some expressions out there that that um i echo so um in an effort to keep water out of the, uh, out of the stormwater system we uh we built in a 1200 square foot rain garden on site so the area in red represents the 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 reef uh square footage that is contained into the rain garden which is the area identified uh with the green highlighting so basically all of those downspouts are then tied into subterranean piping that go into the rain garden so it's designed and we <laughs> we've had a few rain events uh in the last couple of weeks and um so it's designed to for that water to to hold in in that pit and then dissipate over 24 to 48 hours i mean when that was constructed it was probably about eight foot deep and there's a very particular mixture of sand and mulch and rock and gravel uh, that goes into that but it basically then just lets the water ease back down into um, the water table instead of being pumped in almost done thank you for the reminder though it's part of my job absolutely i appreciate it you should if, do you have a button on there that does like the jeopardy song or? it actually oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's very effective um we're almost done so here's a photograph of of the rain garden um this is what it looks like so you know it just looks like a, a nicely landscaped area i'll go ahead and flip through some some photographs these are just through the construction process um demo construction as we were getting uh things going and then these are some completed photos this hallway shows uh, 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 um, some artwork that some kids did when the school was open that we were able to preserve. So those are the hallways now. Uh, you'll see some of the wood trim reused. Exterior photos, these are the outdoor patio and pergola areas, seating areas um, with lighting and landscaping. Here's a unit that, uh, as I said, employs the use of that chalkboard. More wood trim. These are kitchens in uh, different uh, units in the building. Bathrooms. And then this is the community resource center. This is the office side, training rooms, and uh, et cetera. A couple pictures from the grand opening, and then here are the partners. They, it takes a village, as they say, and uh, all of these folks were really instrumental uh, in making this happen. Thanks, Gabe. Absolutely, thank you. I think the, uh, the before and after are quite amazing. And uh, truly a wave of the future. We get we get an awful lot of uh, adaptive reuse uh, type of uh, projects coming through uh, Kentucky Housing, and and this is obviously a great success. The energy efficiency uh, is just really tops it off. Uh, the third award that we're going to have discussed today is the Innovation Innovative Solutions uh, Energy Efficiency for Residential uh, Award. Uh, which was awarded to Partnership Housing Incorporated, and here to speak on, on their project is Cassie Hudson. Hello, thank you all for, uh, I guess, for this award today, but uh, like Gabe said, this is not only an award for Partnership Housing, um, but for one of our employees and plus our mayor court member. And yes, I did say just one employee, so, <laughs> We are uh, a small organization uh, based out of Boonville, Kentucky. So if you can tell by my accent that, you know, very country. Um, we're actually the poorest county in the United States. Um, Partnership Housing is the only housing organization that has ever had any involvement in Boonville or Owsley County. We've got a population around 4,800 with approximately about 78% of that below the poverty line. Um, partnership housing was created in 2006 but really from 2006 to 2012 there was really no work uh, done but in 2012 they finally got off their feet I think from 2006 to 12 there was probably two new construction projects completed and 40 or 50 little thousand dollar band-aid projects as I call them and being in the poverty line that means that a lot of our homes are pretty much dilapidated. 
But since 2012, we've completed our 24th new construction project. Uh, approximately 80 rehab projects that ranges from $15,000 to $60,000 projects. Um, brought in, yes, I'm bragging, so, but I'm very, very proud of us. We've uh, brought in a little bit over $4 million in grant funds into Owsley County and, and around $3 million in loan funds. So this, this award, really, it, whenever we uh, put in for it, it's not for a particular project, but it's just uh, our energy efficient way that we went since 2012 on all of our new construction projects. But this is just our mission statement, which is to increase the amount of safe, affordable, and decent housing for low to moderate income residents in our area and to help those residents achieve better lives. So in 2012, they really got on their feet. Um, in partnership housing in 2013, had their first home, uh, new construction, hers rated. Um, this home was universal design and it was built per KHC specifications in the 2009 energy codes. This house scored a 76. Um, although this was a great score compared to what our existing homes was in Owsley County and even what other homes was being built uh, by individuals, this was not the, at the rate that we wanted to be. Um, yes, Asley County, even though we're very small and rural and have a low or high poverty, we have some of the highest utility rates also in the United States. And that's due to the fact that uh, there's not many people there. The homes are scattered, so the utility lines may go for miles and they may not have any service to anyone. Um, so with this, we knew that in order for our homeowners to be successful, that we had to find ways to keep their utility bills down. So we made this our top priority. Um, then in 2014, our board uh, passed a resolution requiring that all of our new construction homes uh, be HERS rated, and they must score a HERS rating of 55 or less. And it also says in our bid packets, in our contracts, after the contractor uh, is completed, if the HERS rater comes in and our homes are 56, it is the con contractor's responsibility to do whatever it takes to get that below 55. And they sign an agreement to that, and it's at their cost. Um, so we did that. You know, this meant changes to our building materials, our house plans. Of course, we have very high development cost also. You know, we don't have no lows or we just have a local um, building supply company. We're 30 or more miles away from uh, three lane roads, uh, Natural Bridge State Park's probably the closest uh, interstate and things like that. So building materials, everything is very expensive there. Um, it also had to change the contractor's construction techniques to successfully meet this goal. They were used to building one way of course, nobody likes change. And we just pretty much had to put it on, it was gonna be this way or no way, and if you didn't build it this way, then somebody else would, so. But they came to the idea. Um, but this decision, you know, not only made our homes more affordable for our residents, um, but it gave our children a higher quality of life and it showed greater success in our, in our schools when these kids live in safe, affordable, and decent homes. Um, not only do we put a lot of these techniques I'm gonna go over in a little bit into our new construction projects, but we also try to incorporate as many as we can in our rehabilitation. And with that being uh, said, you know, this also increases the tax base um, in Owsley County. It makes the county more attractive, and it also increases the economy uh, by pro pro providing jobs and local contractors, laborers, electricians, heavy equipment operators, and et cetera. This is the house that we first had hers tested, um, and it was a 75, a 76, and this house was a four bedroom, two bath for a family. I think it was a little bit over uh, 1,300 square feet, and I'm thinking the development cost on that was around 120 something thousand. Um, of course, you know, we don't do low income housing tax credits or anything like this, so a lot of our homes are built with SUSTI and with loans. 
and most of our subsidy we get developer subsidy and uh, home buyer subsidy most time through KHC or or Federal Home Loan Bank um, this is just a couple pictures of it during the construction process and this is some of the things that we did it in this house that was I wouldn't say was an upgrade now but at that point compared to what was being built um, in Owsley County than it was just like the R insu R38 insulation the attic um, the 14.5 sear HVAC which is considered energy efficient vented crawl R21 in the floors R19 in the walls um, the standard 40 gallon hot water heater uh, we we did start out immediately doing two by six exterior walls and 16 inch centers which which allows for additional R value and insulation um, metal roof we was doing a standard of package appliance energy efficient windows and a and standard light bulbs but like I said we wanted to, to do better and we wanted to get under that hers 55 so after we after the board passed the resolution the next house it tested at a hers index of 50 um, this was a three bedroom and actually the only the cost between the hers 76 and the hers 50 is a forty two hundred dollar cost by doing these upgrades we are saving our homeowners over a hundred and something dollars uh, per month so the cost of that is going to pay for itself in, in around four years um, but this is just some of the pictures of the the inside of the home that tested the 50 as you can see you know there's the energy efficient appliances now this house had more upgrades than the previous one we started doing R55 insulation in the attic, 18-point um, sear HVAC unit. We went to condition crawl spaces, R21 insulations in the walls, uh, Geo Springs hybrid hot water heater. This actually lowered the hot water heater lowers the hers rating by anything uh, in the house. It actually uh, lowers it by 11 points. So I mean that just that hot water heater uh, does a great reduction. Uh, the hot water heaters are around a thousand dollars as in a standard water heater is around 300 but that hot water heater actually pays for itself in about four to five months so it's a it's a very good investment for our homeowners uh, we went to energy trust we still kept the two by six exterior walls and 16 inch centers the metal roofs we went to all energy star appliances we reduced a lot of double and triple windows to singles um, all of our windows and doors had to be sealed with caulk and energy tape. Um, we went with all CFL light bulbs, started caulking, made sure all the penetrations, framing, joints, and drywall was caulked, uh, started insulating all ventilation pipes, and these homes became so tight that we had to start installing the energy recovery ventilation systems. Um, that also adds to the, the lower hers and we also integrated the low flow faucets and shower heads now this is our latest uh, I guess accomplishment this is our lowest her score of a 37 this is just some pictures during why it was under construction and if you'll notice on the third picture at the top of the roof there's the solar panels um, on that roof um, this project Baitable Housing which is a neighboring um, housing organization we partnered together to construct this home and the subdivision that partnership housing created at Maple Lick uh, up until 2012 Asla County did not have a uh, subdivision so partnership housing created the sub the first subdivision in Asla County we like uh, one home in that subdivision will be complete and we're on the start of our second subdivision but we partnered together to uh, to build this home we added all the previous uh, green building techniques that I just went over and uh, Baitable Housing was uh, able to secure some uh, funds from an anonymous donor to be able to purchase uh, the eight solar panels so the solar panels was no cost to the homeowner um, and so we got the lowest rating of a 37 and that's the best that that we've got to date 
And actually the homeowner, I just uh, looked at some of her energy ratings for what she was using. I think last week she was in the negatives. She was at negative 1.2. So it's really made, she's had 120 and $30 electricity bills um, this summer. And mine's been 300 and I live in about the same type of house, you know, square footage. So um, it's really made a difference in these homes. You know, of course we want to get people in housing, but we want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep them in that housing, keep it affordable. Um, and talking about multifamily, partnership housing was just awarded and we are starting to build our first set, uh, two sets of duplexes. Hopefully by August we have those under construction. So. We're integrating a lot of these green building techniques into those duplexes too. So and that's all I have. I got a question. Actually. Okay. <laughs> sorry, one, one question. Yeah, question as you, from the panel. Yeah, sorry. As you were going through it, you talked about the energy you recapture. What what is that? The, you said it was Panasonic something. Uh, Pan Panasonic Energy Recovery Ventilation. Yeah. What is that? It is a ventilation system that is installed in the home that puts fresh air, air back into the home. Okay. And when a home's too tight, then you have the dangers of mold and mildew right. and windows sweating. Right. So they're so tight because we're building them so energy efficient that we're having to put some energy, some hot, fresh air back into the, okay. to the house. Okay. Any other quick questions? Yeah, there's a picture on here. Okay. Let's see. That's this one here is before it has the cover the on bottom it. left okay. yeah yeah it's before you, it has the cover on it huh? okay neat thank you cassie thank you and just for your information chairing true accomplishments is not bragging mm -hmm. and so uh, um, there, you have much, much to be proud of uh, there in Alsa County. Uh, the fourth award is the Innovation Solution Award for the homelessness, uh, for homelessness. Uh, here to present or here to uh, talk about their success on that is a representative from Greenhouse 17, uh, Diane Fleet. Is this going to loop or should I do it? Do you know? Well, I started it up, so I, I don't However know. you want me to do. Oh, I guess it's looping. I'll make it, it stop like then. Okay. Let's go back, I guess. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah, I'll get out of it, and I'll get back into it. Maybe that'll make it start again. Okay. I knew nobody else did, so I don't want to So I'm Diane. I'm with Greenhouse 17. And I think really what I would like to talk about today is we're really trying to get folks um, ready to um, participate in a lot of the housing that you all are here and talking about. You know, when we're talking about uh, victimization of domestic violence in Kentucky, we would say that one in three women in the Commonwealth will experience domestic violence, intimate partner violence in a lifetime, and one in seven men will experience um, severe physical abuse due to intimate partner violence. So it's a daunting task, and we um, are in the central Kentucky region, so our residential facility is in Lexington. We're on the eastern edge, and we changed our name to Greenhouse 17 in part because the 17 represents the 17 counties we serve. So it's a mix of, of um, geography, a mix of place, a mix of folks. Seven of our counties are Appalachian region. So I'm just going to kind of narrate photos um, just to sort of pop up, I guess, a little interest. When we first, I, I think you might have seen the picture before, we moved out to a 40-acre um, eastern edge rural area in Lexington, Kentucky. And to be quite honest, we didn't know what to do with that. You know, we're 22 social workers, we're housing 40 women and children at our residential facility, and we even though it was beautiful and gorgeous, we weren't quite sure what to do. And one of the journeys, I think, we're on a little bit of an evolution, but one of the journeys that we're really working on is how to not hide and talk about survivors of domestic, domestic violence in victimization terms, but really to be talking about we're a productive part of this community too, we have a lot to offer, we have a lot to say, and we didn't want to be hidden anymore. So how can we engage the community in the work that we're doing? And also when we have folks come in one of the very first things we do is safety plans. So we talk about barriers, um, issues that keep folks in, in homes of domestic violence, and we know one of those things certainly is lack of affordable housing. It's hard to leave a home if you don't have another home to go to and you can't afford that home. It often keeps you very vulnerable to going back into those situations. So that is where a large part of our energy is spent. 
One, just kind of talking about the healing process and getting at the trauma pace base that women are really dealing with and what their kids have experienced, and then building from that. I think a typical um, response before with shelters is a lot of case management. You have 30 days to come and stay, and then we got to move on. Well, it's really hard to base a plan in 30 days. And so we really kind of have slowed that um, that narrative to talk about let's just set for a little bit let's heal a little bit and we knew that there was this piece right in the land that we had that was talking about this is there's so much therapeutic research that says this is something that we all can get back into and and just sort of calm down a little bit and then part of what we're looking at here i think i think it's going fast but it's okay because i'm going to go fast anyways so um <laughs> can you pause just for a sec okay sorry I should have just done it myself, but I didn't trust myself. Um, one of the things that we were talking about as well is we knew that a lot of women and children had lack of affordable, um, healthy foods. And so we really looked at the gamut of what families were experiencing. And one of those was nutrition. Um, one of those was kind of getting back and having responsibility in, in, with relationships with your kids. And so we really wanted to bring that nutrition back in. And as a nonprofit, we were spending a lot of money feeding 40 women and children, usually about 200 to 250 women and children every year. So the garden had multiple um, influences on our programming and it just was this perfect fit you know everything that we were talking about money coming into the program re-engaging with the community at large you know inviting folks in talking about trauma um, being good stewards of the land you know I think across the nation and certainly in Lexington there was this whole movement of you know buying local and local food movement and food deserts and recognizing you know that people didn't have access and so we really thought everything that we we're talking about it's 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 impacting this and then the other piece I think which is participating particularly um, resonant with this group was talking about financial literacy. We often talk in very abstract terms. So when I'm talking to a woman who's from Estill County, which is a very rural county in Lexington, and I'm talking about IDAs, Individual Development Counts, or I'm talking about entrepreneurship, or I'm talking about getting back into the business world, quite frankly, they look at me, or home ownership, quite frankly, they're looking at me in a very dazed way. And so how can we make these narratives and these offerings that I think there's amazing work going on right now but make it seem feasible and possible and so as we as a program we're starting to talk about growing our own food and doing some small business and talking about healthy nutrition and talking about farmers markets as we were doing this they could go oh I do that too you know I don't know how many times people have sort of said I could never do that, I could never do that. And it takes somebody from the outside going, but you're already doing that. If you're a single mom and you're making $800 a month and you're surviving, you're a pretty good budgeter, quite honestly. You know, it would be nice to have more income coming in, but you're actually doing a pretty tremendous job. Let's give us, let's give you more wealth. Let's talk about wealth generating things that we can do. Let's talk about the skills you already have and let's put those to practice. But again, if you have a person who really has excuse me, not experienced a whole lot of success, that connection is really hard to make. And so slowing it down and kind of having them participate again as we were sort of learning as a nonprofit to not just be dependent on others to, to grow our program, we could say, let's sort of do the same thing. You can model what we're doing as a nonprofit in your own family. Okay, I think I'm ready for the next one. So we're doing a lot of garlic, um, onions, vegetables. Is it still going to go? Yeah, it should. You want me to go ahead and flip through it? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Well, let's You're on. good. There You're you go. okay. Um, so we're doing a lot of make it, take it classes too. One of the things that we noticed as well yeah, one of the things that we notice as well is, you know, women spend a great deal of money in their in their home of, of just sort of maintaining, or if you're talking about budgeting, you're talking about gift giving, or you're talking about just sort of sustaining. So we talked a lot about how can you start doing crafts and product development for whatever benefit. So it might be very small tiered. It might be that you're just kind of doing this for your family. You're just doing this for neighbors. It might be you're doing things for Christmas. It might be that you're able to do some small container gardens um, and you're able to supplement 
supplement income. So we're not presuming that everybody's going to make a million dollars if they start gardening. But there's a lot of supplemental ways that you can increase from this. Another thing that we really loved about the garden was, again, the isolation. I think so many people succeed because of the networks they make and the relationships they make. A lot of our families did not have that. So we partnered them with local chefs. We partnered them with local economy. So they began to have access. And it's a little bit like when you're going to school for the first time and you don't quite know what you want to do. You sort of dabble. You know, your first freshman, sophomore year, you just sort of take lots of classes and you begin to dabble. And so people then could go, I'm really liking this culinary. I'm really liking the event planning. I'm really liking the gardening. I'm really liking these things. And it's giving a little more sense of the direction that they're wanting to go. And I've met, that's such a goofy picture of me. And then, <laughs> and, um, and so they're also connecting with people outside because a lot of times, I'm talking very particular of our folks, but they don't have really a good network of individuals that they can lean on. And so they have to sort of recreate who their family and friends and their support are. So this engages them with the community at large, which is not typical at all of a domestic violence program, because again, it's always been very isolated. So being able to reach out and, and be able to be part of things is tremendous. The next step we made was actually making some marketable items. The women really gravitated towards flowers. I mean, the typical piece would, for us would have been vegetables and do some small vegetable CSAs and sell those. But the women love the flowers. And I talked to a guy, there's a program in Kentucky called Kentucky Proud, really sort of supporting local um, you know, economies, things that are grown in Kentucky. And he had said, flowers, berry, herbs, and honey. He goes, it's low labor, you all could do it, and it's, a, and it's a beautiful story for women to be doing these items. So we really moved to the flowers. So we do bouquets for weddings, we do small CSAs where people can once a week buy flowers for the summer for $200, you get a whole season's worth of flowers. Um, we've done events at BCTC, the local community, one of our wedding bouquets. One of the um, community colleges just had an anniversary, so we did all of their flowers for the tables. Um, so we just are really beginning to build this portfolio of things that we're doing. And I think, again, the sense of pride. So if you've had, again, women who have come to our program before that haven't had a great deal of success, the sense of pride, the sense of giving back is really a beautiful thing. So on top of trauma, healing, naturing, community building, the self-confidence, it just mimics all the way through. And I guess, you know, of anyone parting, I'm, I'm going to say this a little flippantly, but as you are talking about the housing that you're providing for folks in the community, and lots of times there's case managers that are involved. I'll tell you, having a local farmer, I mean, it's odd to have a nonprofit agency that we hired a farmer, but I needed that. But, but finding, what, finding what you can bring to start building community in your own housing programs and building that sense of self-worth and building that sense of identity, I think there's something innate with the nature aspect of it. Um, but I think there's lots of things you can do. I've thought about bringing computer programmers on site and having people go through tech stuff. I mean, I think there's lots of things to do. But begin to em engage your folks that you're serving and thinking of the human aspect of who's living inside your walls, I think, is really critical. We did build a commercial kitchen. Um, all of our products are developed there. Um, we do now a lot of body products. I wanted to open a restaurant. The women said we really like body products, so body products it is. We're doing lip balms and um, body balms and soaps. We have an Etsy site. So again, if I have a woman I'm picking on Estill County, I don't know why, but it just, there's not a lot of job opportunity there. So if I can have a woman stay in her home, take care of her kids while they're not, it's, you know, while they're not in school and be able to stay and do that and set up an Etsy website and make a little money, you know, it's a wonderful supplement to income that they really desperately need. Um, so these are some of the lip balms we were making in our kitchen. So it's really been quite a journey, and it'll be interesting to see kind of where it goes next. But um, I'm sort of liking it. So I think we're about done. It's about through. Some of the local churches also, before our commercial kitchen was done, let us kind of come in and do some work with them as well. Here's our sap that we make on Etsy. 
we raised about our first year really doing this product we raised about twenty five thousand dollars worth just of product sales my goal is a hundred thousand I think we can do it um, some of the women actually work on the farm so if you're coming in you have no income we just pay a small stipend we can be great job references so if you've had spotty work history and we can kind of come in and say you know she shows up on time she cooked dinner for 40 people she led a tour at greenhouse 17 there's lots of different things that we can supplement what's going on with them so that when they go and apply for a position which again when they get housing if they have a job is really critical there's our soaps which are wonderful. It's Mother's Day, so if you're in the area <laughs> and you want to buy, we're, on, we're selling them. I think that might be the last one. Sorry for the confusion. Sorry for the confusion no, of the no thing. Way. I was like, do it. No, I need to stop. No, I need to do it. All right. All right. Thank you. What a novel business model, and it must go miles to helping build self-esteem and self self-worth. So keep up, keep up the good work. And thank you for explaining. Well, we all know now why it's called Greenhouse, why they call themselves Greenhouse 17. But I came across the name about three months ago at work. I said, why would they call themselves Greenhouse 17? I think we all know that now. Our fifth award today is the Innovative Solutions Award for Housing Preservation. Uh, speaking today, uh, representing Wallach Hendy Development Company LLC, is Matt Schumacher, Senior Vice President. Welcome. Thank you. A lot of great uh, innovative success stories, uh, so hopefully we can uh, follow that path on one of the last presenters and uh, try not to take up too much time. <clears throat> I'll try not to ramble too much. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd just like to thank KHC and on behalf of all of our partners, which I'll list in a second, um, <clears throat> you know, for this award for the landings at Maysville High School. Um, let me start off real quickly. So <clears throat> this project was originally developed in 1996 as a tax credit community by a uh, nonprofit. Um, I think with the best um, intentions, but it we used some home funds and some of the rents were just set at way low levels and eventually that execution um, kind of set the project up for, you know, a downward spiral. So the project kind of became a uh, shelter of last resort within the community over 10 to 15 years, where that nonprofit, after a couple of years, was removed by the limited partner. A new GP was brought in just as a placeholder and new management company who really didn't take a management fee whatsoever. Um, the success story on this deal is really about the partnership between KHC and the community and the story that it told uh, in order to recreate this project and make it again a cornerstone of the community. I don't know how many people have been to Maysville, but it's a really uh, <clears throat> beautiful historic town about 45 miles or so east of Covington uh, on the Ohio River. And this building really is stands as kind of the <clears throat> on the main street um, and it sticks out and it was originally a high school in 1909 and so it stopped being a high school I think in 1991 so basically everyone that was today 40 years old went there so when we came in to look at this project you know it hit a sentimental chord with with everyone so <clears throat> we had to tell the story of you know, what our vision was and, and what do we want to see as a finished product. Um, our partners, we have uh, Kentucky Housing Corporation, who provided a subordinated home loan. Uh, Regions Bank, who did the construction loan, and they also purchased the historic uh, federal equity, tax credit equity, and the low-income housing tax credit equity. Our local nonprofit, Buffalo Housing Trace Corporation, um, the Kentucky Heritage Council, for the state historic tax credits. And then Wallach Development, we have our own general contractor and uh, property management company. So, you know, we're just, I'm just one person of a part of a lar larger team. So here's kind of the location of the property. Um, as you come across the bridge from Ohio, uh, you'll see the, the, the building <clears throat> right, in right in the middle of the histor historic district. 
Um, here's some older pictures. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the next few slides is really going to show, you know, this the property went downhill, and the community was wanting, you know, from um, to bring this cornerstone back to something that really meant something to the community, but not only not be a place where, you know, a lot of the less fortunate, you know, it was their basically a, a place to live, but really become a place where it's affordable housing, where you can live and work in this community, which was, uh, com was really lacking in their historic uh, downtown area. There was uh, <clears throat> numerous broken windows, and this project, you know, when we got it, was half occupied, uh, maybe a little bit less than that. There's 29 units. There was people was a month-to-month -month lease. Um, it's a very, very difficult shape. Some brickwork. Here's some of the old hallways. Had extensive water damage in some of the units that were just uninhabitable. Had been that way for you know years. So I'm showing these before pictures because after pictures is really where the success story comes into play. So here's kind of what our financing structure was. Um, it was about a $5 million overall. We knew that in order to really sell this project, <clears throat> you know, we had to make this the nicest affordable housing choice for the residents of Maysville. And we ended up, you know, having to put in close to $80,000 a unit. We had to keep the original windows. Um, there was 208 of them. Some of them were eight by four. We had to have them hand done. It was $300,000. A tremendous amount of costs. I mean, there was a similar themes with the earlier presenter on. I mean, it's it's very difficult with historic deals, and there's a, a lot of things that you have to do to in order to keep the credit or to to obtain the federal credit, the historic credits. Um, <clears throat> but then also some things that are very costly in order to see them come to fruition. So we had state historic credits for a developer fee. Um, the home loan that was originally on the project, the Kentucky Housing Corporation um, worked with us to extend the term of that <clears throat> and lift the restrictions. Uh, so now it's a majority 60% AMI property. Um, the rents really in that market are 50, 50 or so. Um, we have some that are a little bit lower, but it really completely changed the tenant profile. We took some of the, rem the remaining tenants that were there, worked with the housing authority to get the, them other uh, housing opportunities within the community. So we really kind of started from scratch. And we went in, <clears throat> rehabbed the property, and we knew that we really had to sell this vision with the city, but also with our equity providers. And the equity providers, it was kind of tough getting you know, equity in such a rural area, um, but also having a story saying, you know, this was you know, we take them to see it and they say, you'll never turn this around. Well, <clears throat> we had to, had to, we got an equity provider really that could, we took around to the community with a, the police department, with the mayor, where they could really see that um, our vision and they invested in that was Regents Bank. And this is kind of the after product. New court, new uh, outside picnic area. There wasn't. There's not a lot of green green space in this property, so most of the was done on the exterior uh, of the building and the interior. Here's the after pictures of the hallways. Um, those are all the original doors, original floors. I mean, from what it was before, just com completely different property. Here's the interior of the units. We were able to keep uh, all the hardwood floors and redo those, um, a lot of all the wood trim. Um, it was a complete gut rehab, though, be, besides some of the historic characteristics, characteristics that we kept. It's our kitchens. <clears throat> and all the units have really high ceilings and really large windows. So you, you walk in, and it's, it's like a very urban, almost loft feel. And on some of the higher units, you, you have these eight foot by four foot windows overlooking the river and the view, it's, it's really unbelievable. The 
So we had 29 units. Those are the unit mix, 7, 18, and 4. Um, once we finish construction, you know, during the whole construction process, we'd bring in our nonprofit partners and we'd bring up people. Everyone in the community wanted to see it because a lot of them went to high school there. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of people that lived or that worked in the downtown area that said, if you guys can change this project, we'll move in there. And now we have a couple of people that work in a newspaper that walk across the street now to work uh, that are a couple of teachers, uh, people that work at the coffee shop down the street. So it's really, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's really, cha it's really helped the community. Um, so what about a four, it took us about four months to lease it up once the construction was completely done and we're hundred percent occupied with the wait list. That's it. Very good, sir. For those of you who are history nerds, which I am, uh, Maysville happens to be the point on the Ohio River that is closest by land to Lexington. And that's why the town was founded there, because Lexington was founded coming up from the, from the Cumberland Gap. But once river transportation took over, that was where you got off the barge or the, or the boat and were able to take overland stages to, uh, and, and horses uh, to Lexington, for what it's worth. What we saw here was a great example of what a great vision, a little bit of money, and a lot of cooperation can do to transform a piece of property that was clearly failing in Maysville into one that, that was quite pro appropriately titled on your slide as a success. So uh, congratulations to you guys for that. Are there any other questions for the panels? Well, please join me in applauding and congratulating all of the award winners because this is, this is truly uh, truly an example of what innovation and what the, what the wave of the future is going to look like. And uh, hopefully those trophies will look good in the, in the trophy case at work because uh, uh, they look pretty good here. So uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the, co the uh, conference. When they ask you which session was the best in the, uh, in the uh, 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 questionnaire, uh, make sure you name this one as the best because uh, uh, this is where the innovation for the future is, is coming out of. Thank you. Thank you very much.